Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Hello. Thank you all so very much for coming out tonight and your attention. And thank you, Gil Stein and his team, for inviting me here um, for, and for this wonderful introduction. And I will not forget the volcano in 2010. It is a great honor to speak here in, in front of such a learned audience. And I hope also my talk, perhaps in the next 45 minutes, will um, actually uh, inspire you. Um, perhaps afterwards also you have lots of questions that you would like to uh, discuss. There's lots of work to do in this field of color and polychromy pigments research. There's work for everyone here, so if anyone is interested also in joining um, on the search, so please um, welcome to introduce yourself um, after this. I also want to start with two warnings and one disclaimer. You will see lots of colors and lots of images of color in the next 45 minutes or so. So I warn you, and um, it is sometimes really a lot to take for for the average visitor to see so much um, surface uh, on a statue. And I will talk a little bit about chromophobia, a term uh, <laughs> that uh, comes up here um, later during this talk. Um, I also want to uh, have another warning. I might sometimes speak a little bit fast, and this is really my enthusiasm. So I apologize and give me a sign at some point if I'm just too uh, quickly here. So then just give me a sign and I slow down. As you hear, also I have a very strong German accent. And this is also uh, represented in my uh, structure of my talk. Um, I'm very organized um, as a German. <laughs> so I thought I would um, yeah, uh, break up my presentation into three parts. In the first part, I'm going to talk about overcoming homophobia. What is uh, homophobia? In the second part, I will talk, uh, which is called completing the picture. I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about how to approach ancient and contemporary aesthetics in Persepolis, the work I've been doing now since 2006. And in the last um, chapter, I will give a little bit of um, ideas what could be done in the future with these uh, projects as we move along. And this chapter is titled, titled The Last Painted Kings of Iran. So whether we still repaint Persepolis is one question. Um, perhaps it was actually um, asked in the 19th century when uh, colleagues discovered the colorful world of Greece, whether we should repaint the statues initially. So I mean, there are some um, thoughts perhaps um, I think that would be worth asking and addressing again. I want to start with one quote by a, an, a curator and good friend of mine, David Bachelor, in, uh, in London, who published a book called Chromophobia in 2000. And this one quote, for it is one thing to know that statues were once brilliantly painted. It would be, however, another thing to not see color when it is still there, I think is very appropriate. We really have not been used to look uh, close at uh, statues. And we, we just, we know that there was something there, but we do not look at it. So um, this basically is one of the um, quotes I found very appropriate for, for the work that I've uh, been doing now. And um, I think there's lots of food for thought in another quote um, that was uh, coming from an Italian um, uh, conservation scientist in 1996 in this wonderful book, which I can recommend to anyone who's interested in cultural heritage and preservation issues. It's called Historical and Philosophical Issues in the Conservation of Cultural Heritage. So her quote goes, art historians and curators of major museums were the very ones responsible for destroying uh, traces of color, patination, and toning layers. The ravages of time and pollution have been nothing compared to the damage done by restorers. Removal of the surface and violent cleaning with hot water and ashes, or washing with sponges soaked in nitric acid have almost completely destroyed any traces of polychrome finish spared by the effects of time. I think this is a very appropriate quote also, and you will see some of it also in my talk, that it is really the modern time period who wiped away uh, the colors uh, that could, that is an important evidence for us if we uh, look at the ancient world. So how, who has been to Iran? Could you perhaps raise your hands? Okay, that's a good number. So, um, but I thought because there is uh, 
uh, many people who have not been to Iran. I want to briefly show uh, actually the country that I'm talking about here. So Iran um, to the south of the Caspian Sea, modern capital Tehran and Persepolis is about 14 hours. Um, if you take the car from uh, Tehran to Persepolis, stop by in Isfahan, it's a beautiful city um, to visit. So um, this is approximately the 14 hours right here and it's also to Susa, another site that I will briefly mention in my uh, talk tonight. Um, it's another uh, probably 10 hours from Persepolis to Susa. So these are quite um, uh, long distances also that um, people uh, travel today and that they and people traveled in the past. And this is modern Tehran. So just to give you an idea, there's lots of pollution in Tehran, as you can see here. Um, it is uh, an amazing city with 12 million inhabitants today. And Isfahan, another city, I hope you all take this opportunity next year um, to visit um, uh, Iran with the Oriental Institute. It is a, a great place. Um, uh, to visit culture and sites. And uh, what we see today in Isfahan basically is like this, these fantastic um, surface decorations in the mosques um, in the 16th century and later uh, created there. So this gives you an idea of um, what are the predominant colors also in certain ways um, that we see um, in the medieval what we say medieval um, period in Iran. And we kind of come back to this blue that is pretty, pretty uh, much dominant in Isfahan when we look at Persepolis. So this is the site, an aerial view uh, from above. You have uh, lots of palaces uh, splattered all over the, the site. You have to um, actually approach the um, terrace by walking down or walking up these staircases and then entering this gate. And this is just um, a plan that shows you. So we are here looking at this gate. And here are the staircases that you go up. And then you have these buildings here, the Apadana, which I will um, talk more about in a second, and other palaces spread all over the, the terrace. Um, this gate um, here looks like this. So it is a breathtaking sight when you stand in front um, of this gate. I always have a really shiver when I'm coming there. The first uh, time that I approached also the terrace of Persepolis coming by a taxi from Chiraz, I asked the cab driver actually to stop for a second. And it, it was just for me a moment in my life that I will never forget to seeing this um, site for the first time. It is breathtaking. So it's the UNESCO World Cultural Heritage Site since 1978, nine. Now, so it's, it's on the list and uh, people take very good care also in Persepolis. So it's an amazing team that makes sure that on the site um, uh, the, the surface of the monuments is preserved. And so I've been working and it's a great honor also for me to uh, present some of their work here um, because this is a teamwork. Really. This is a teamwork. I cannot do this um, alone. I have to work with uh, lots of um, other colleagues to find out the the details that are still hidden on the surface of the monuments. So you see the carving of these monuments alone is um, um, overwhelming. So you have here these griffins, you have these uh, crawls, giant size, and when you see the fine details, how they have been carved out 2,500 years ago by the workmen who came from all over the Middle East, including Egypt, which was a very important um, uh, culture that contributed uh, with their technological knowledge also and brought um, um, experts to Persepolis. Am I speaking too fast? <laughs> okay. Um, good, so um, you see, you see uh, fast facades on these buildings um, with um, uh, military um, yeah, uh, uh, people uh, standing lined up there, all 40 um, famous uh, kings that we know from the Persian Empire, Darius, uh, Xerxes, Artaxerxes, we know all of them really lived there. We know their, their names, how they were addressed to, in, thanks to uh, tablets that were found all over the, the site in Persepolis. And again, you see the carving, um, how fine and detailed it is, what types of stones also they use. They use two, set, two different types of stone, limestone on the facade, so it's not marble. And uh, limestone actually makes it also a little bit more challenging to find pigments because marble is, is usually better on the surface to preserve um, pigments, while limestone um, is a little bit more um, difficult to uh, look onto the surface. Um, some of it was covered for many uh, decades after Alexander the Great. They call him the Great. Um, I'm usually addressed as Alexander the Small when I come there. <laughs> so 
Alexander and his generals um, are the ones who obviously were responsible for burning down much of the uh, palaces and structures. You can still see also some parts uh, where the ashes are um, laying there. And so this has also been covered actually uh, for many centuries until the Oriental Institute um, came. And uh, with two German scholars, again, Ernst Herzfeld and Erich Schmidt, whom you see also featured in the exhibition that is um, on display, um, began excavating more of the, uh, of the monuments. So this is what I've been doing now since 2006 with the help of my colleagues there. Basically, I feel like a doctor in some ways here, trying to um, go there with a, um, with a microscope um, that is attached to my uh, computer, to my equipment also, and just looking for, uh, uh, for, for traces of paint on the surface of the monuments. And as you will see in my lecture tonight, there's a lot of pigments preserved there. And so um, there is a lot of work uh, to be done in the next um, couple of years. This is the museum in Persepolis, and in the storerooms also you find plenty of materials similar to what you have here on display. Much of it has never been touched also by uh, conservation uh, scientists, so there's always a good chance, and I will show some examples, that you still have traces of paint when it's freshly um, excavated and has never been touched um, uh, by someone um, uh, since excavations. So I mentioned the tablets um, that give us a lot of information about those who worked on the site. Um, and I'm going to talk now a little bit about um, the modern rediscovery of polychrome Persepolis. So starting in the 19th century when people um, began excavating in the Near East, so uh, with excavations um, near Mosul, um, Khosabad, Nineveh, all of these sites um, that brought up um, these huge palaces um, to the forefront. And what people painted back then was really a whiteness that appeared from the ground. So they also, in, in the public uh, sphere at least in the 19th century, um, people would also not think about the colors that originally um, uh, were on these uh, facades. So this is what you see in contemporary um, drawings and paintings a lot. But there were um, um, examples already how you can reconstruct in a museum um, the polychrome environment of the ancient East here in the Crystal Palace in London. There was a special room in 1854 where um, colleagues uh, um, had experiment, experimented a little bit trying to restore some of the, um, of the facades, how they originally were painted. And you see actually here on, the, on this one, this is what we have at Persepolis, Susa, these typical capitals. And there are um, also uh, um, correspondences preserved um, that uh, where curators also exchanged their ideas about how was it actually looking like. So very interesting correspondence here. And some of these uh, plaster casts actually are still preserved. So this one, for instance, which is now in Berlin, in the museum, in the Vorder Asiatisches Museum, shows how in the 19th century people, um, when they went to a museum, also had still these color re for reconstructions right next to the um, monuments. Um, we have then in the 19th century, with uh, coming back briefly, briefly to Greece and Athens, a remarkable discovery right next to the uh, Parthenon, to the Erechtheion on the monuments of a group of um, uh, Cori, ancient Greek uh, statues in 1886 that still had lots of traces of paint preserved, ironically from the Persian uh, war, from what they claimed was uh, hidden actually, um, so that they could be preserved. Um, on the side, um, this is what we have still with lots of traces of paint preserved on these marble statues that were um, excavated in 1886 in, in Greece. On the uh, Parthenon itself, on the uh, uh, temple um, that was dedicated to Athena, if you look closer actually at uh, some of the um, fragments that are still in Athens preserved, you can find out easily on uh, traces of uh, bluish here in this, and uh, it's often hidden really in, uh, in parts that are not so easily accessible to, um, to touch. And you have also here, I don't know if you can see this in this uh, picture on the right, there are still traces of blue. Um, all over the original stone uh, facade uh, preserved. So you can see, see even with the bare eye um, still some of these original traces of paint and can imagine also how Phidias, this famous uh, sculptor, was working in the fifth century, approximately the same time that Persepolis was um, built and constructed uh, with his team of painters on the surface of the monuments. Um, in Susa, the other uh, important site that we have today in uh, southeast 
uh, in southwest Iran. Um, excavations began in the, also around the same time in the 1880s. And what they discovered were lots of fragments of glazed bricks which they could reconstruct um, to such facades, which are today in part in uh, the Louvre in Paris on display, giving an idea, at least on the glazed facades, how um, they portrayed um, people from the empire, from the Achaemenid Persian Empire. Um, you see actually in some, of, not in these cases, but different skin colors even. So this is a topic I think that would be, if anyone here is a student interested in a dissertation topic, skin colors in the ancient uh, Achaemenid Persian Empire might be uh, perhaps an, one of the topics that one could approach um, here. Also excavated were finds that um, um, shed light on the original polychromy from earlier civilizations in, near Susa, like this um, head here from the second millennium BCE. And right next to it, we have one of the um, uh, cap capitals that crowned the columns at Susa in the palaces. And uh, traces of paint were actually found on this one too. So um, it was noticed back then. And there was an attempt in Paris in 1886 for the World Exhibition um, to display, um, again, Susa, how it was originally, uh, in this case, um, thought to have looked like. And the excavator, uh, Jane Diolefeu, had a very interesting um, uh, comment actually that, she, that I want to share briefly. She wrote about the Susa um, finds, behold then, aroused from among the dead, this antique polychromy, denied, exalted, and contested with violence in the archaeological tournaments. By what? Moderns of degenerate mind? Do you dare to accuse the monumental painting of Elam and of Hellas of brutality and barbarism? Would you deny the important role of color? So she was also aware, actually, that there was kind of a whitewashing, um, obviously, going on. And people did not like to see uh, the colors of the ancient uh, Near Eastern civilizations and of Greece in the museum world. Um, in the 19th century, another French visited Persepolis, took actually a mold of one of the Apadana um, uh, depictions here, brought it to Paris and overpainted it like this one. So this is an uh, 1860 approximately reconstruction of one of the um, uh, people depicted on the Apadana in uh, Persepolis. In Washington DC, this is the place where I'm now, um, so I looked into um, all the 19th century and 20th century archives and what you find is that one of the um, buildings on New York Avenue in Washington DC had a house, halls of the ancients, where they also reconstructed poly polychrome um, versions of ancient temples. And among them was also one where they had even a real Xerxes sitting as a dummy. So this was in around 1900. This is the original um, door that you see here in Persepolis still on, this, on the left side. And this is the reconstruction that they made in Washington DC with um, Xerxes on the, on the top. Um, so here we have another shot of him. Um, how they engaged also the public in reconstructing these um, ancient empires, something that you barely see because we have an academic approach now in most of the museums. We will not do this because um, we just have a higher standards perhaps. Um, so it's something that uh, we can perhaps address um, at, the, at the end of the, the talk. In the 20th century, of course, with more excavations all over the, the world, like in this case, in the 1970s, the Chinese terracotta army had still tr lots of traces of paint preserved. And um, when we look even more recent time periods, the Gothic um, uh, uh, facades that we have now in Paris and Notre Dame originally, this is a reconstruction that French colleagues did in the late um, 1990s based on some of the surface um, stat analysis you see. 27 layers of paint on one single statue from the 12th century up to the 18th century when it suddenly started. Um, no, we do not like these um, abundant colors any longer. So um, you can imagine that each time uh, in the medieval period also had their own distinctive um, aesthetics in how we should um, paint um, our buildings. Okay, let's go back to Persepolis. Uh, Ernst Herzfeld, whom I mentioned briefly before, has um, in his letters um, one um, reference to the, to the pigments that he found or the colors. It goes, I nearly forgot to mention that yesterday during the bare laying of a door in the Tripolon, the lower part of the relief depicting a king with servants, the entire colors became visible. First, I th had thought that all of the sculptures now buried in the earth had the natural color of the polished stone, it is black. 
Now it seems that the reliefs were painted entirely in bright contrasting colors. What a strange impression this must have been. Written in 1932, which gives us actually an indication also that uh, those who excavated at these sites obviously did not also had kind of a previous knowledge about the, this whole uh, polychromy. And this was the case also when I did my master at Berlin and Humboldt University in five years. There was, I think, one reference in one class that everything was painted originally. So I went through my undergraduate um, uh, pro program also without having been informed about all of these um, uh, paints that were originally um, uh, covering these facades. Ernst Herzfeld, here you, ha um, you have him with his excavation team. Um, and we have actually one uh, interesting drawing in the Smithsonian preserved from the from this uh, staircase that led to the um, Persepolis Terrace. And with the black dots that you see here, there's a small um, written line here. And I'm going to translate it for you. It's in German. So the German translation is on the ground. The English one is Romeo bumped into an ink pot and walked upon the drawing. The new drawing is already finished. Bergner. This is Romeo. <laughs> so lots of um, also complications in Persepolis on the site um, where drawings had to be recreated. And um, so this is a normal life on an excavation um, site. Um, Karl Bergner was one of his um, uh, helpers on the site, committed suicide in Isfahan in 1936, unfortunately, but left also many drawings uh, from Persepolis uh, uh, beside. So I'm going to focus on a few um, facades and on a few case studies here in the next few minutes. Um, Herzfeld himself made one drawing that is a painting that is preserved, so of one of the uh, door gems of the Hall of the Hundred Columns. And this is how he envisioned um, this originally looked like. Um, I went back there also in 2008, and you can still see actually quite a few traces of paint. I have not done a reconstruction of this one, but people have actually um, thought already um, a little bit about it. We have several of such um, depictions um, all over in Persepolis of this man. And if you look closer, you see that some of them actually here, this, the, this tool that he's we wearing in his hand here is carved out. Here it is not um, um, carved out, so it would have probably been painted originally. Um, in, instead, the same is here with another one where you have the enti entire circle on the right picture is left out here while you have it carved out on the, on the left fragment. So you see there's an interesting interplay here between also what has been um, carved, what has not been carved, what originally was then perhaps painted or not uh, painted in this case. Um, some facades already in the 19th century, another French uh, colleague went there and made this reconstruction. Uh, and, and when Ernst Herzfeld went back to the same uh, stone relief, he found actually that there are traces of blue instead of red on the shoes. And this one it would not be yellow, but, but red. So what's going on here? Some of the uh, shoes have been found in the storerooms and they have traces of blue and red paint on them. So what is actually uh, going on here on the surface? I'm going to talk about um, in a second. Herzfeld also made a lot of um, photographs, close-up photographs. Um, they are preserved here in the Oriental Institute. You see here also closely the lion uh, frieze of a garment of one of the kings at Persepolis. And on the back side of this photograph that he took in 1933, he wrote there are traces of gilding on this um, rim here. of the. So I went back 2007 and indeed if you look closer on this um, particular stone relief, you still find actually some interesting layers there on the, on the surface. And you find a really good stratigraphy also, as archaeologists call them. So you find also in the, in the surface of these monuments um, traces of paint. So the research goals that I had set up was how broad was the spectrum of pigments and painted motifs in Persepolis for these 200 years. The second question that I had, can we really determine a pigment stratigraphy? And then how far can we document degradation processes from data on polychromy contrived by earlier archaeologists and conservation um, specialists working in Persepolis. Um, my overall goal is, uh, of course, preserving what is still in situ and uh, also mainly document and uh, 
have a, as much as possible detailed um, a database with all of these pigments uh, still preserved on the site. What I've been using so far is uh, scientific equipment that I could um, borrow in Iran or from colleagues in Europe. Um, so I was working with the microscope. We used mobile XRF, we used UV, UV light and other uh, technologies to determine also what the pigments were uh, made from. And then of course it's archival work in excavation uh, notebooks and all is about um, transparency and collaboration um, because you want to share of course as soon as possible any information that you have. The bull that you see here was originally um, on, these, uh, on the whole of the 100 columns, the red arrows here, so in these sides, this is the bull that we are just looking at that is still in situ in Persepolis. It has been um, uh, found um, right in front of uh, the monument and was pulled up again in the 1960s by a conservation uh, team. And if you look closer at this bull, you still can make actually some, uh, with the bare eye again, traces of blue pigment. I don't know if you can see this, but there are some tiny um, little traces here. Um, and also, if you look at the eyeball, there are reddish traces visible with the air, uh, bare eye, um, if you can um, see this from where you are. Um, if you zoom in closer now, you have the whole uh, s uh, structure of this um, uh, original pigmentation. So you have here the blue in a very uh, close-up um, photograph. And this is, um, again, another um, idea to give you how if you use good equipment, how deep you can zoom in and find original traces of paint. In the nostrils of this bull, you still find traces of this reddish um, ochre that um, was originally, as I have argued, a ground layer actually for another um, layer on top of it. And in the museum, uh, this is the modern museum in Persepolis, you find still actually lots of um, smaller <coughs> fragments that also revealed some of the stories. So in the storage of this particular ear, you find right next to this um, reddish layer, these blue dots. So there's again a kind of a um, small um, yeah, story here that remains to be um, discovered or talked about, I think, um, by future researchers. I'm gonna skip this a little bit, but the other bull that was um, excavated um, by the Oriental Institute as you see here, and you see some of the wonderful exhibition uh, photographs that were made in the exhibition um, nearby, was restored here by Donato Bastiani, an Italian um, conservation scientist. And you see not a single trace of paint of this on this anymore. So I hope I do not offend Gil Stein or anyone here in the Oriental Institute by saying, unfortunately, modern museums play a role in wiping away these um, colors. So if Donato Bassani had been trained perhaps more also at this time about um, what you do by um, yeah, touching surfaces, um, I hope we can at one point find out what exactly he was um, or the team uh, he was working at also in the 1940s um, thought, but for now it remains to his, uh, the brother bull in Persepolis to give us the clue originally how these um, uh, monuments uh, were originally painted. So every time I'm going to Persepolis I send many greetings from this, uh, his brother here and so I'm trying to connect them a little bit with my own uh, personal history here. We have inscriptions all over the pla platform in Persepolis and these inscriptions um, they, they took squeezes, which is a kind of a wet um, paper that you put on top of them to um, get um, the, uh, in, a negative inscription out there. Many of these squeezes uh, were brought to the United States and are preserved, some of them in the Smithsonian. So I looked at them in 2009, and what you still see is tiny little pigments in these uh, squeezes even. So when they took these um, paper mash, they took out accidentally also some of the original um, uh, paints uh, by, by doing this. So this is again the question, how far do you go when you do um, want to uh, find out about inscriptions uh, by taking all of these squeezes, molds that you take from objects, you take away evidence, of course. Uh, in this case, this is from the Nakshi Rustam. This is right near next to Persepolis, the fa facade of the tomb of Darius I. And if you look closer, actually, this is a drawing of the facade, um, Darius uh, depicted with inscriptions around. And uh, you still find lots of um, 
uh, traced, traces of pigment in these squeezes that were taken from these uh, Naxius Tan uh, Darius facade in the 1940s. We can determine what they are. In the Smithsonian we did some analysis uh, because the pigments are now part of this uh, group. So we found out this is a, a closely coming to an Egyptian blue, which I'm happy to explain later about what this exactly is. So it's a copper-based um, uh, uh, material that they used to create blue on the surface of the monuments. And if you go actually in Naxchus town up on the on a on a structure there, you still find original traces of um, blue in these um, inscriptions there. Even on the on Darius himself, if you look closer, you still find traces of blue on his beard here, like in this case. You find traces of blue on his crown originally. On his eye, you have still very vibrant actually here the black, probably a charcoal. Um, originally used and um, you have on his mouth still preserved traces of a reddish surface layer and here you have again the beard um, where you see traces of a blue um, originally um, uh, attached to the monuments and on the facade entirely you find still original traces of the um, of the paints. In another facade and that is closer to Persepolis, another tomb, I went up there in 2009 again with a crane and so when you go up there, you see really vibrant uh, traces of paint. So what is now appears to us as blue and green, you see some greens here. It is not entirely clear whether the green is originally the green that was seen back then, because many of these um, pigments are also changing appearances over um, the centuries. So, but you can document actually quite a lot of the original surface structures. And this is the only reconstruction that I made. Um, so because it's not so harmful, I think, to the eye. Um, imagining how this particular facade of Artaxerxes, in this case, uh, might have looked like originally. Also on the capitals on this fa facade, if you zoom in closer to the bull um, on the eye, you still have still traces of the original um, ground layer of, of red that was um, covering uh, the facade. In uh, Persepolis on the side, so we went with um, uh, colleagues from Berlin there in 2010 and what we found on uh, some of the surface there, for instance in this case, which was originally also on the column uh, capital, um, crowning uh, this um, capital, and if you look closer, I always say he should go to the dentist. This is a kind of a plaque or so that you find um, on the tongue of this uh, particular um, lion capital in this case. So we still figure out actually what exactly, what are these layers that are preserved here. In some cases you find even brush strokes where you can look closer how actually they um, did um, some of these um, reconstructions. And then when we went to some of the uh, Persepolis reliefs that are today dispersed around the world in museums, um, we can have other equipment that you can use. This is from the Apadana, which was brought in the 19th century to Berlin. And you find out that on most of these parts that are now um, kind of depicting metal equipment, like um, these spears, this dagger here or so, you have a higher concentration of lead, PB, here in some of them. So when you look uh, closer and look at the chemical uh, elements there, this is an, an indication that there was something going on here on the surface of these, what was supposed to look like metal. So maybe this was something that gave it a shiny um, a touch um, originally um, uh, to, to yeah, make, make out um, these, these military equipments here in this case. Um, if you zoom in closer again, this is the same relief uh, from Berlin. You find also parts of the what the woman, uh, the, the cleaning lady in Berlin used as a um, um, when she wiped obviously with her, um, yeah, with something over the surface. So they also um, took the colors away. This happened also actually in Persepolis on the site where um, some um, people who were instructed by foreign teams tried also to clean. Um, the facades in some ways. So um, this is one of the darker chapters also that where foreign um, um, archaeologists were involved and some of them used also rather abrasive um, yeah, um, tools to get uh, uh, to make the surface clean so to speak. So they used uh, various different methods also to how to best um, preserve 
the surface there, and this is what um, was done in situ to the monuments. We have, of course, nature, wind, there's uh, snow in Persepolis, there's rain also, so it's, it, there's no perfect way uh, to preserve um, these pigments um, anyway, so it's best to not um, touch them. And in addition, um, we also found bowls with paint um, in them that were initially excavated, uh, some of them by the Oriental Institute uh, team. Um, so they were directly, in some cases, in front of the uh, monuments. So in front of the Apadana, and I marked them in these colors so they, that they are easier also. So bowls with blue, with green, red pigments in them were directly deposited in front of the uh, facades. Um, as I have argued in my, in my dissertation and in my book, which will come out, this was not because they didn't have time to finish these, but these were so kind of important to uh, devote this to the Apadana building themselves, these uh, kind of pigments. Um, so this is um, one possible um, yeah, explanation for this. Here you have some of these um, bowls of fragments mostly that have still traces of paint in them. And this one here is in the Oriental Institute in Chicago. So you still see um, how dry actually it, it dried out um, the original bowl with the pigments. I'm not going to go into pigment analysis because our time is already, already up. I want to add a few things. Um, not only pigments were covering the surface, but also metal attachments. In this case, this is a, a relief of um, one of the kings. And you can see, he, oh, sorry. You can see that there are still holes where originally there was um, an inlay out of a, a different metal. So aside from being painted, they had also additional materials. So the polychromy is not only poly uh, colors, but it's also different um, media, so to speak, that they used um, on the surface of the facades. So as I'm continuing, I'm helping, I get a lot of help from my Iranian colleagues. These are my colleagues in the archives in Persepolis who have the best um, uh, kept organ, organized also um, yeah, system in making sure that they know about previous excavations on the site. And I want to thank you all for um, joining me for this uh, evening lecture. And there was wet paint at some point in Persepolis. So thank you everyone for being here tonight.